Okay, here we go. Uh, so we have a full afternoon in front of us. Um, my name is uh, Ray Langenbach. I'm the professor here at Utah at, and chairperson of the Center for Artistic Research in the Faculty of Creative Industries. Uh, and before I introduce uh, Professor Joyce Chi Wei Liu um, uh, from Taiwan, uh, let me just uh, do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you have comments or questions for the speaker, um, actually for the speakers in all of the sessions, um, please put them into the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Um, and then they will be compiled uh, by the facilitator, myself in this case, and, and passed on to the speaker. Um, alternatively, if you wish to, to, to directly uh, speak with the, um, uh, the speaker or, or me, or if you wish to voice your comments uh, or questions, um, just raise your hand in the Zoom and, and uh, hopefully I'll see you and, and uh, then you'll have a chance to uh, speak directly. It, it makes it a bit more lively than the, than the very staid uh, um, passing the questions through the facilitator process. <clears throat> so um, that said, uh, the, the, uh, the talk will go for 35 minutes approximately and, and uh, then be followed by Q&A. So Professor Joyce Chi, we knew, thank you for coming. Uh, we welcome you here. Um, she has uh, a truly awesome biography and curriculum vitae. Uh, and I uh, will just mention a few things from it um, to introduce her, but you can, you can uh, find a lot of her details online on, on the internet. Uh, she is a chair professor of critical theory, comparative literature, visual studies, and cultural studies at the Institute of Social Research and Cultural Studies in National Chiao uh, Tung University in Taipei. She is also the director of the International Graduate Institute of Inter-Asia Cultural Studies University System of Taiwan, uh, which is a network of several research uh, universities. Uh, her own research offers a critical view of East Asian modernity um, uh, Chinese political thought in the 20th century, biopolitics, border politics, unequal citizenship, civic exclusion, and internal coloniality. And today she's going to be talking about one of, one of uh, the topics dear to my heart, which is alternative uh, theater, the theater of the people in, in, um, in uh, um, Southeast Asia and, and Asia in general. <clears throat> and um, propaganda um, to two topics which are very interesting uh, to me. She has uh, multiple research projects running in parallel right now, including one exploring conflict, justice, decolonization, critical studies of inter-Asian societies, another one on migration, logistics, and unequal uh, citizens in the global context. Uh, Professor Liu has produced more than 100 peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters and six books. Um, I'll mention a few here. Uh, One divides into two, Philosophical Archaeology of Modern Chinese Political Thought, uh, 2020. The Topology of Psyche, the Post-1895 Reconfiguration of Ethics from, nine, uh, from 2011. The Perverted Heart, the, <coughs> excuse me, the Psychic Forms of Modernity, 2004. And Orphan Goddess and the Writing of the Negative, the Performance of Our Symptoms from 2000. So once again, um, Feel free to engage with the speaker either through the Q and A or uh, you can raise your hand and and um, uh, 
and I'll <laughs> speak directly. And now I'll please welcome Professor Liu, of, you know, who will speak for 35 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, William, for your uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, also, thank you and the team for inviting me to be here. This is such an interesting, uh, remarkable event. Uh, I have another uh, concurrent ongoing uh, series of webinars this week, so I cannot attend more than I wish, but uh, I'm glad I'm here. Uh, so, as you know, I am a scholar of critical studies, critical theories, uh, political philosophy, internal studies, but I am also an educator. I teach students in classroom. My students are from interdisciplinary background. And for example, history, literature, arts, performance, and anthropology, sociology, and so on, international relations too. And they are from different backgrounds. Uh, at different countries. Uh, we are now having more and more students from Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Thailand, um, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, and South Asia, uh, India. But we also have students from Africa, Eastern Europe, and also, of course, Italy, Spain, and Belgium, and so on. In my class, I would encourage my students because in the future, they either ended up as scholars or uh, other uh, cultural activities uh, leaders. Some of them became uh, curators in museums. Some of them made a uh, uh, photograph or videos or uh, documentaries and uh, or uh, into independent journalists. So I encourage them to explore different historical, different disciplinary backgrounds. But also, uh, since in recent years, as I said, we have different student uh, background, of course, also from Taiwan and uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan, Hong Kong, China. So in classroom, when we dealt with issues related to our history, that is a uh, history shared uh, globally, but mostly uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia colonial past, a, a Cold War, the post-Cold War, neoliberal uh, uh, capitalism, and also the, the Cold War regime, knowledge production, and, and so on. I realized more and more that my students oftentimes, uh, when they came to our university, our institute, uh, they came with their past history the narratives that they receive were, educate, were educated through their education from kindergarten, from elementary school, from family uh, education. And the, the historical narrative is very, very clear so that they have established their value system, their standard and their sense of good and bad, right and wrong, their spontaneous reaction towards certain people. So that's why I included more and more uh, these common issues. For example, chronic capitalism, uh, precarious conditions of migrant workers, refugees, uh, ethnic conflict, religious conflict, land injustice, gender inequality, uh, vigilante, and so, so that they could share the experience with other students. Of course, we also use video uh, and visual aids and so on. So today, I would like to share with you several modes of storytelling. The title of this conference is uh, fantastic. Stories we make and the stories that make us. Okay, so I will start to share my screen, my uh, PowerPoint, and let's begin. I will start 
I don't know whether you are familiar with it. I thought you should, uh, whether you have watched it. I did. <laughs> and uh, many, many students from Indonesia did. Okay. So let's start with this uh, to see one form of storytelling. I'm sorry. I tried to adjust the volume, but uh, it turned out to be. Uh, it is a little uh, unbearable to watch these uh, scenes, right? And hear the music. The music from Mozart, Red Korean, uh, goes along with the scene in which uh, General uh, Pan Shai Tang uh, was executed by so-called leftist uh, people, communist parties, and the daughter crying a a company with this very uh, moving music. The death toll of the event that is described or reenacted or performed in this documentary is about the 1965-66 genocide. The death toll is around 500,000 and some said 1 million and some said 2.3 or even 3. Uh, million. The victims were accused uh, of being communist members and executed without trial, the, the large scale hunting, uh, like witch hunting, and their families were exiled to neighboring islands and deprived of their citizenship status. Until today, the full account of this historical incident can you try to move? Uh, I don't know whether I can move this. Uh, anyway, the full account of this historical incident was has never been uncovered, nor officially acknowledged or rec reconciled by the government. The propaganda film made by the Suharto during the Suharto regime by the Ministry of Information and Re of the Republic of uh, Indonesia through the state film production center adopted the mode of storytelling to enhance the status control by uh, and also covering up the historical reality with the intention to stigmatize the communist party members as a cause for the event and to stabilize the new ruling regime, which is the new order and new economic order that comes after. The most uh, 
I'm sorry, there are bugs are popping up from my uh, screen. Ah. I don't know whether that, that's blocking the view. Uh, anyway, this film uh, broke, uh, is the most broadcast and most watched Indonesian film of all time, according to some record. All television stations are required to broadcast a film until 1998. And Students are compelled or requested to view the film together since uh, from their elementary school. A survey done in 1987 by Temple, their uh, journal, 97% of the students in, uh, in the survey had seen the film. 87% of them had seen it more than one time. And in another survey done in 18, uh, 1984-85, that shows that the survey for the threat for Indonesia, and the, the highest one is uh, the resurrection of communist uh, party, far higher than the problem of corruption, which we know that is notoriously uh, uh, known, okay, till today. The lasting effect of the new order is to fixate the vision of pre uh, pribumi or uh, non-pribumi, prioritize indigenous population. and to form an Islam state and to institutionalize the uh, ethnically structured model of citizenship, as well as institutional discrimination that's shared by the population. So till today, uh, maybe not today, but uh, maybe five, six years ago, in the documentary uh, shown by Joshua Oppenheimer, uh, he let us know that the teachers in the classroom are still teaching the intimidating lessons of the communists in classrooms. He said, communists don't believe in God. They slice the general's faces with razor blade. To change the political system, they also want to change the political system. So they have no reason, religion, they are evil. And what do we do? We shall thank the heroes who help us to get rid of the communists and to save our democracy. So that scene that I showed uh, previously was uh, in uh, Joshua Oppenheimer, uh, Oppenheimer's uh, documentary, The Act of Killing. In this film or uh, documentary film, the look of, uh, 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 the look of silence that sequel to The Act of Killing. The audience sees that Literally 50 years after the massacre, or uh, 20 years after they stopped screening the documentary, all the teachers are still teaching the criminal lessons. Uh, the, 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 the lessons that criminalize or stigmatize uh, the communists. So, the act of killing and the look of silence directed by Joshua Oppenheimer can present to us a different form of storytelling. We should say that it's a documentary filmmaker as activist. Maybe we can watch a, a short clip, a clip again.
Buka, buka. Baby itu udah bagus, akting baby itu udah bagus. Cuman jangan lama kali nak nak nangis saya. Pekong lima, inilah di tempatnya di. Aku bilang itu darah kantor darah. Jadi double perasaan alam. Ini antara ganjang Cina sama ganjang bertua. Ada tikam juga, kerem Cina juga. Anwar Kongo bersama teman-temannya mengembangkan suatu sistem baru yang lebih efisien dalam menupas komunis, yaitu sebuah sistem yang manusiawi. Kurang sadis dan juga tidak menggunakan kekerasan berlebihan. Tapi ada juga langsung disikat habis saja ya Pak, nggak usah disiksa dulu. Maybe you can skip. So Oppenheimer invited Anwar Kongo, an executioner in a, or the murderer in the massacre, to help him act out in the production of his documentary to reenact the way he, Anwar, executed his victims. This scenes of reenactment created multiple perspectives from both the victimizers and the victim. The horrific de details of what these murderers did in the past are narrated, reenacted with vivid uh, setting, physical actions, and presenting a series of visual impacts. The audience re-experienced the dire fact of the cruelty of the event and was traumatized again. The testimonies presented by the victimizers further challenged the fictionality of the government's official narrative. And Excuse me, I, uh, we see that in the sequel, uh, Look of Silence, uh, of uh, sequel to the uh, uh, killing of silence, uh, killing of silence, um, this uh, eyeglasses is a uh, fantastic, tremendous uh, skill to metaphorically show both that uh, the eyesight it needs to be readjusted because the entire society share the blindness and disavowal of the people who have really denied the historical truth. So the politics of denial, politics of this disavowal is prevailing in the society. So this murderers, they live in peace of mind. They say that the proof is we murdered people and were never punished. I've never felt guilty, never been depressed, never had nightmares. So this is the word of impunity and denial. And from the interviewees, we also see that all these people are still in power. He, they said, under the dictatorship, when everything is tense, you can't imagine what would have happened. The other person even threatened and said that the mass killing were the spontaneous action of the people. Do you want to repeat it again? It can happen, okay, anytime sooner or later. So the interviewer, the doctor, his brother was uh, murdered during the accident, incident. His mother said, our village, in our village, the mayor, the teachers, they were all killers. So can they do anything? Can they say anything? So this is a word they live in.
when we step back and think these three different documentaries or two types, we notice that even though they are stories in the past, they are documentaries of the present. All three documentaries are documentaries of the ongoing uh, state of mind, institution, and uh, attitude and mentality and so on. These films are inscribed with the voices of the present, the status regime, the institution, the mentality of the, uh, the producer and the directors to let their stories be heard and to be impressed. The difference between this official governmental uh, propaganda and uh, Oppenheimer's documentaries are the former presented a mono perspectival narrative. The latter, however, allowed diverse perspective to tell their stories from the subjective position. This is just a very simple uh, uh, distinction. A lot more could be discussed and said. But uh, concerning this uh, later kind, Diverse positions surface to the foreground and re-embody the conflicting lived experience still existing in the present time. Because of the time limit, I need to just move on uh, to show uh, different kinds of uh, storytelling and those are voices and from below people theater. Maybe let's start uh, from two clips. 就是看人的东北亚 会有那些无法发生的民众，我们说的people，它就是个people。可是它是它不是这个精英的people，它不是被国家所定义的people，它是这些无法发言的在体制之下的老百姓。我当我们说我们要去追寻这个不同的地图，不同的地址，一个不同
to finish the clip that I wanted to, but this uh, people's theater or theater of the oppressed uh, actually was very widespread in the 20th century under the influence of uh, Augusto Bauer and uh, from Latin America. But in the past three, decades, uh, uh, starting from 1980s, East Asia and Southeast Asia also had a booming of this uh, people's theater. Uh, according to uh, Roman Roland, he said early in 1903 that state belongs to history, but the people belongs to the present. So uh, three years ago, our center, uh, uh, curated one event that is uh, where the people are, there we shall follow. Okay, that is uh, we invited uh, theatrical groups from Hong Kong, China, Japan, Korea, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, in India, uh, Indonesia to our institute and our actually those are initiated by students we have uh, different students from different uh, countries so they collect all the materials and they are uh, uh, made a map visual map of the group and also they help us to invite the important representative uh, theatrical group from different countries, mostly from their own home country. So we talked about historical past of the people theater and remapping into Asian historical context of that uh, theatrical hist uh, history, regional solidarity, local practice. We talked, discussed uh, this uh, translocal practices and exchange in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Asia and also labor issue uh, from Hong Kong, mainland China, and also Hong Kong and Japan, Korea. So these are the groups and we see the map uh, interlinking. They influence one another, okay? And they share their historical past. So this uh, theater kubu in the scene you saw is that uh, this is a uh, very interesting, uh, very important. I actually appreciate them very much. Is that they organized and mobilized uh, teenagers from their village. The village is right next to the cemetery. And the, according to him during his talk in our uh, uh, event, he said that those are sometimes uh, drunker, uh, they, they uh, do violence, at, uh, fighting, and even uh, drug addict. They drop out of school and they are 
they have nothing to do. So he uh, gathered them to do games, plays during festivals, and they even started to act. So uh, in the end, they actually went to Jakarta, the, the stage, and won several awards. But Ding Dong, the director, said that they, uh, he gave up this uh, original planning to use uh, existing script. They won this uh, uh, actors, actresses to uh, enact the problems they encounter in their daily life. And also they use improvisation. They use uh, materials from their immediate environment, like nets, bamboo sticks, uh, metal uh, storage drums and, and so on. So that, and also they use their daily life language and idiom so that their community, their neighbors can see what they are trying to convey. The other, so in this scene, we see that it is actually a critique of the injustice, the land deprivation, and also the decision made in the parliament. And also this rolling uh, table uh, uh, to and fro shows the util futility of their attempt to, to protest. So uh, the other, play is about the flood uh, in their, uh, uh, in Java. Because of the very weak, impotent uh, government and weak infrastructure, so that there are often times a lack of electricity, lack of internet information, lack of water even, okay. So Ding Dong said, as a reflection of history that moves through every era, chronically uh, contextual, uh, according to the history of the times of Indonesian uh, society and political conditions. So tracing possibilities will make, uh, uh, they, they use different objects to enable them to tell the story so that people know what's wrong. The other theater uh, from South Korea, the director originally were among the uh, labor union. They also have labor union theater uh, in South Korea in 1980s. Uh, this uh, activist movement from different corners are very, very uh, strong and they have close affiliation from one group to the other. But in late 1990s, uh, neoliberalist uh, competition or market and so on. So the original uh, theater changed their uh, nature. So this director started to collaborate with international uh, art uh, directors. One of them is Huang Moling from Taiwan. And the shot clip you saw just now was about a young worker uh, who protested in early 1970, okay, who protested the labor right that is so totally uh, um, inhuman. So he actually committed suicide by burning himself but holding the, the book of a labor right. She became a legend. And in 2011 or uh, 18, mm, 2000, uh, yeah, anyway, in our uh, event, they perform. The moment when after the death, after the event, the mother was trying to think back how his son said goodbye to him. And the, the remorse, the, the, the regret, but also the understanding of the necessity of his, her son's uh, action is so clear in her physical language, physical gesture. Other stories uh, they, they performed, 
uh, like uh, the North Korean defectors. Okay, also directed by Wang Moling. So now let's move on to maybe the final few pages. Sorry to interrupt, about five more minutes. Okay, yeah, I can finish that. So the, the essential thing I really want to say today is not the different forms of storytelling, but what do we tell? How do we tell? How do we not to repeat the same story that we were told? And how do we deal with our contemporary uh, conditions and dilemma or difficulties? Well, as I said, we are still facing internal colonialism. Colo coloniality is not just a question of military occupation or political domination during this uh, special period. It indicates a matrix of uneven power relation through which some parts of the people in the same society are exploited, excluded, and cannot enjoy equal op opportunities to actualize their capacities. The hierarchy of power relation is reinforced through political, juridical, economic, cultural infrastructures, discursively and illegally, depriving people of equal and autonomous participation. So what deserves our attention is that such colonial power structure not only exists in the colonial period, but also in our society through, as I said, the institutional and discursive forms. Coloniality in the in is interaction uh, context is particular, particularly interesting and uh, alarming. That is the citizenship concept adopted during the colonial period is regenerated after the colonial period. So-called citizenship becomes a politics of exclusion. The prioritization of ethnic group and other people are non-indigenous, that's only one kind. Okay, there are different kinds of uh, hierarchization and stratification. So the paradox actually today we see, okay, reaches its uh, extreme form in the cases of migrant workers and refugees. Migrant workers from neighboring countries, migrant workers who, who or originally share the same tradition, maybe the same kingdom or dynasty, okay, of different period. But now they become the underclass, okay, and become dispensable, just a uh, pure labor to be utilized. So when we talk about storytelling as artistic intervention and cultural critique, we are talking about the fact that everyone grow up in an environment with all the neural, uh, neural a uh, numerous texts of the same storytelling technique, same morals. Okay. Naturally, they will share the same ideology and adopt the same pattern of behavior, the sense of self-righteousness and justification of exclusive discrimination arise from their fundamental cultivation and often act out spontaneously. It cannot open, but if we can try to think all different kinds of possibilities to disrupt and to critique and to suspend or call the halt on the reproduction and repetition of the same modes of storytelling, maybe we can open up a space for people to re-experience a more complex reality and could build up a more uh, capacity to emphasize and to understand and to communicate in the same uh, society. So storytelling with diverse pers uh, perspectives as we see are uh, either the activist uh, documentaries or people's uh, theater from different region all told us how to listen to the voices unheard from different corners. Finally, 
storytelling as engaging with decoloniality in our uh, context. Storytelling as artistic intervention and cultural critique can provide a strategic in engagement to challenge the consensus shaped by the status memory politics and the systemic internal colonialism commonly practiced in this region. Different modes of critical storytelling can activate critical consciousness, not only for, uh, for the audience who watch it, but the, our student and the entire society and maybe uh, people up there. So the storytelling can show us a different chronicle of our community, witnessing and archiving our present moment and exposing the lines of separation that exclude uh, some people from our community and we do not, we are not aware of the problem. We justify our ideology and so on. So I'll end here. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very, very interesting paper. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, there are no questions yet uh, that I see in the Q&A. Uh, probably some will be coming. Ah, okay, here comes one. Um, okay, uh, yeah, Victor Chen is asking, may I ask what are some of the, the possible perspectives or approaches that we could take in reclaiming our narratives or decolonize the colonized, uh, both academically and artistically? Excellent question. Uh, to decolonize, not the, only the colonizer, but the colonized, that is a key issue because the colonized will reproduce the same structure, the same uh, coloniality, uh, either they mimic the colonizer and practice uh, their position, their role, or they are convinced that they are not good. Okay, they are uh, they are born to be in this position and they don't transgress. So that is a problem. So as I said, uh, but to reclaim the narrative, there's no not only one thing. We are facing land pollution, environmental pollution, construction that's uh, depriving our, uh, our uh, home or uh, space, our uh, neighborhood. We are also facing joblessness. Why, for example, <laughs> in Indonesia, but uh, the same for other, other places that is uh, chronic capitalism and also the, the huge uh, wealth property owned by only a very few uh, percentage of the population. Why cannot that fact be more transparent and why cannot, but uh, it, it requires uh, efforts and critical self-awareness and consciousness from all corners, from different groups, uh, feminic, feminist group, uh, from the minors, from uh, it's a minority from uh, all kinds. So uh, I, I think there's no one solution, but just to bring people's uh, self-awareness. I, I think this is uh, uh, Paul Freire, uh, his uh, critical pedagogy uh, uh, lesson. Okay, the, 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 the whatever education, our performance or storytelling, if they don't do this uh, uh, this other way around, then they are like the banker, they uh, deposit whatever they want and they, they can get all the capital they, they save for their own utilization. So the student just take in whatever we're told. Okay, so either as artists or teachers or uh, activists, uh, or student uh, will be uh, 
cultural leaders or whatever, or just a father and mother. Uh, they need their self-awareness and self-consciousness before anything can happen. Yeah. Is, is, would you say that there's a, a, any problem with um, Joshua Oppenheimer um, in entering into the society of Indo Indonesia from another culture entirely? Probably he brought uh, uh, yeah. insecurity to their family. Yeah. But you want to continue, right? Yeah. That, um, yeah, I mean, he, he was bringing a film tradition, which uh, in a sense came from Cloud uh, Landsman and uh, who filmed Shoah, you know, the eight hour yes, analysis yes. of the Holocaust and, and um, uh, the, and, and part of that and, and that film as, as well as um, uh, others, which, which have the perpetrators and the victims speak. And so, so uh, Oppenheimer brought that methodology. So in a sense, he's entering in from outside, but, but uh, um, because he was coming in, as I understand, through an NGO and was working actually on the poisoning of the workers locally and the, and the people in the NGO said, yes. why don't you talk to the bosses? Why don't you talk to the, the perpetrators of the poisoning yes. and of the, the oppression? And so then he did, and he discovered that they were the same people who had carried out the atrocities um, uh, during the Suharto, early Suharto uh, coup and era. Um, and um, so, so he's coming from outside, but he's using an inside methodology, uh, which, is, which is very, yes. very um, sure. interesting. So, it, so there is a, it's, you're saying on the one hand that stories are, can be a form of propaganda, but they, they can also be a form of counter propaganda. Uh, so, so yeah, do you want to expand on that a bit? Um, you know, this, uh, and is there, do you see a problem in somebody from another culture coming in and, and um, in a sense showing what, what has not been able to be seen or shown um, uh, through the continuing oppression uh, sure. in the society? Uh, yeah, sometimes it's, uh, yeah, it's always uh, also even an ethical issue, right? Confronting this uh, uh, victimizer and, and uh, having them go through this process and, and so on. But uh, sometimes uh, that risk of, uh, that risk, or this experiment is inevitable in if we want to uh, really adopt a different perspective that uh, from the one that's being reproduced from within. If the perspective and the modes of mind are, are still in the cycle of repetition, nothing uh, different can be uh, told or it could be, uh, of course, there are different uh, documentaries on this uh, 1965 event uh, from local event, but uh, Joshua Oppen Oppenheimer's uh, two documentaries actually started that trend and started uh, and, uh, and really call people's attention to this uh, politics of immunity and those are politics of denial. So, the pro and con, right? Every artist has to bear the responsibility and so so the risk of the ethical issue they are going to face. But if this is not uh, worse, uh, I mean, I, I cannot say good or bad because as I said, uh, there are different modes of storytelling and that, that that's inevitable, right? But I, I just want to insist that uh, there is no, uh, I think if we said only insider can tell the story, then nothing, uh, there, there cannot be a new uh, curve of the yeah, movement. Yeah. One, one more in, 
question, time for one more question. We, we should have made this a two hour <laughs> presentation, I think, uh, because you believe in complexity and, and that's what we're beginning to get in the questions. Um, uh, so Adriana Norden Manam uh, asks, and this is, a, this is a long one. In my discussion with peers from the arts and social sciences here in Malaysia, we often lament the fact that the frameworks of oppressor oppress that binary she's talking about and decolonizing, decolonizing and subsequently cultural appropriation are often uninterrogated imports from the USA, especially. This often limits our ability to speak about racism and unequal citizenship in our own societies. May I ask any advice you have uh, for storytellers from our part of the world to sharpen the way we reflect on these topics as part of our craft? Uh, where can we look? Academic resources are more than welcome to draw out more nuances about decolonizing narratives. Do, do you want to read the, the other question so that maybe I can respond that's, to all of them? No, that's yeah. the last one. That's the last one. The last one. Okay, all right. Uh, I think there is a danger of this uh, being too much uh, imposed upon by so-called uh, Western or Eurocentric or US-led uh, artistic trends, okay? There are many, uh, uh, even curation or art, this uh, avant-garde art, they are, they are still following, chasing after this uh, so-called uh, biennial uh, uh, Vienna uh, uh, modes. Um, there is this danger. Okay, unless local artists, uh, they start to really reflect upon local issues from experiences, from interactions, from daily life observations, from the real uh, uh, encounters with people from different uh, corners. But to adopt the style, there's no problem. You know, there is no so-called uh, in uh, immaculate local practice or pure local knowledge. Everything actually trans, uh, traffics, uh, I mean, thousands of years, hundreds of years that we, we, we use, we appropriate all different styles, just like we can change our dresses. Uh, we, we, we perform whatever we think we want to. But that is still very simple. In terms of artistic uh, endeavor uh, or intervention, we can use whatever language. We can use African music, drumming. We can use uh, uh, jazz. We can use uh, very traditional uh, Indonesian, Malaysian, or even Chinese uh, style. But the story we tell will be different. Right. So, if we are afraid of the uh, outside influence, then uh, we actually deprive ourselves the wealth of language, the wealth of uh, possibilities. So, uh, but to be self-reflective actually is the first step of decolonization. Decolonization starts from within and the internal colonialism is a real issue. We cannot find any excuse and cannot blame the former uh, colonizer or this uh, US uh, and so on. No, no, there's uh, no way to really confront our current reality. Yeah. I'm afraid I don't know that. we have time for um, uh, we, the, the next uh, talk is gonna come right on the heels of this one. Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, your knowledge and, and uh, your, this information. Um, and thank you to the audience for, um, uh, for attending and, and your, your good questions. Thank you.